Hi, so I'm Beverly Ibsen. I've been practicing law for five years. Uh, of that, primarily has been uh, family law. I'm also a captain in the Washington Army National Guard. I'm a traditional MDA soldier. Our state judge advocate, Colonel Bennett, is here. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, but I'm speaking for myself uh, and not for the Guard and not for the Washington Military Department. So to start off with, uh, first of all, I'd like to get to know uh, you a little bit. So can my attorneys please raise their hand? Attorneys? Okay. Good. Most of you in this room are attorneys. Now of the attorneys, who currently does family law? Okay. Two hands coming up. Who has done family law in the past? Okay, a few more hands. Now I noticed that there's a lot more hands that have done it before and are not still doing it. So <laughs> when I uh, introduce myself as a family law attorney to other attorneys, I get mixed reactions. And uh, one of the most strong reactions I got was, oh, I'd rather bag groceries than do family law. And um, some of that has to do, I think, with the nature of what we're dealing with. What we're dealing with is a lot of emotions, we're dealing with kids, we're dealing with finances, and we're dealing with an uncertain future. So my intent with this presentation is not to make you experts in family law. Quite frankly, I don't think you can be because there are going to be variations of everything uh, under the sun. At, for as many different types of people as there are in the world, there are going to be different wrinkles um, to a family law case. But in the context of what we're doing here with Rally Point 6 and the Volunteer Legal Services Clinic, what you see is somebody who is bringing maybe some paperwork to you. They're bringing you a scenario. They're in the middle of something. They have no idea what they're doing usually. Now, there are some clients that are more sophisticated that will have trial notebooks prepared, that will have done their own motions, that maybe will have briefed an issue. Those, those people are rare, um, but we're going to address them too a little bit. Um, but there are two things I'd like to clear up, first of all. Um, one, something my grandma once said to me that I thought was hilarious. Um, I was trying to show her a YouTube video of me getting sworn in. And she calls me up on the phone and she says, I can't see it. And I said, Grandma, what's wrong? Just go to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube. I have a Google. <laughs> So each, of you, <laughs> so each of you has a Google, and that is one of um, your most important tools as attorneys, uh, or if people are going to be helping people in a non-attorney capacity uh, and directing them to resources, you have a Google. You have a way to sort of sort through the noise and a way to see their problem that they don't have. So if you're not a family law practitioner or if you were so burned out from family law that you don't want to practice again, you can still help the pro se client. And I think that's an important thing to note. The second misconception that I want to clear up is that there is no such thing as a military divorce, as, a, as an army divorce, and a navy divorce. There is Washington State and RCW 26.09, which is where our laws are going to be found that govern divorce, that govern custody and all of that. And there are going to be military wrinkles to it, military aspects to it. You may be called upon to help a client figure out what's a fair division of the military pension. You might have a client that's going to be deploying, um, but you can't say, OK, well, since you're deploying, we're going to wrap this all up in a month. That's, that's not going to happen. They can ask for an extension. A 90-day extension is typically what's being sought under the SCRA for an active duty uh, soldier. They can also uh, ask for ex parte relief to deal with emergencies, and the deployment can be a basis for that. But they're not going to get a special military divorce with a special military divorce judge. So as we go through this presentation, and I realize that the um, once I start it going, you'll be able to read it. Right now, what you see is kind of a road map. So feel free to interrupt me with questions. Um, if there is a friend of yours, a friend, <laughs> sometimes I hear that, uh, or uh, you know, a client that you're serving or that you've just heard something you know, concerning to you about our court system that you would like addressed or cleared up as it relates to family law, then ask me. I'll be happy to interrupt my presentation and answer that. Um, but as you can see here, we have a start 
and a finish here. The start, I'm gonna go over the basics and kind of the big picture family law case. As we get to the finish, which is the resolution, either going to be through a settlement up top or through a trial, which is the bottom one. Along the way, you're going to have motions practice perhaps and parallel proceedings, and we'll get into that in a bit too. But my very first case out of law school was through the King County Bar Association Pro Bono Program, the Family Law Mentor Program. And the way that my mentor put it is you have a big case and a little case. The big case is you get a decree of dissolution. You get a final parenting plan. The little case is all the emergencies that come up along the way or the contempt of court that comes up along the way, the temporary orders that you need to maintain a status quo while the case is plodding along to a final resolution. So with that uh, in mind, let's get started. Okay, so these materials, by the way, will be available to you electronically. Um, this is an online web-based presentation program called Prezi that I'm using. The basics, so the big picture um, issues is we are, first of all, we're a no-fault divorce state. So when a client comes to you either in a clinic setting or in some other setting and wants to tell you about their spouse's affairs or just um, perhaps emotional issues, emotional abuse issues, uh, or you know he did this, she said that, um, I don't get along with their sister, what, whatever, the emotions are, are going, those are valid, you want to acknowledge them but then refocus them. We are a no-fault dissolution state, which means it only takes one person to say the marriage is over. Irreconcilable differences is going to be the grounds the court will look at. It's possible for one person to say, no, I really don't want a divorce. I think we can work it out. Our laws do provide for counseling. Um, the, the, technically, a commissioner uh, could order a couple to counseling. I asked that question once on the listserv and I was told no. <laughs> you want to talk your client out of that because you don't want to be the one advocating for forcing counseling on the other partner, on the other spouse. Um, it's, it's theoretically possible, but if the other spouse is really set on a divorce, chances are that you're just going to make your client look bad or that they're going to look bad by really trying to force the other person to stay in a marriage. So. Um, I have links here. You can click on as you look at them at home. We'll go back towards the end if we have some time to kind of explore these. But uh, most of them cite, as you can see, to the RCWs. This is 2609. That's the main one that you're going to be looking at uh, as you use your Google. <laughs> also, the community property definitions is found in 26.16.030. And the best interest of the children standard, which I'm going to get into in a second, is found in 2609.002. But the basic points here are we're a no-fault divorce, we're community property state. And what does that mean? That means that any property that's acquired after the marriage or before the date of separation or any debts are going to be presumed joint. They're going to be presumed of the marriage. That does not, however, prohibit a court from dividing separate property assets, so property that someone brought into the marriage or that was acquired after the separation, or separate property debts. Because the ultimate standard that the court is going to look at is a just and equitable distribution of assets and debts. And if it's needed, if it's necessary to take some from the separate pot to equal things out, a court can and will. Maintenance. Um, you hear some myths, and if someone wants to throw out some myths as we go along, uh, that you know we might have a requirement of maintenance if you've been married a certain number of years. Or that you might hear a myth that you're never going to get maintenance in Washington State. The reality is typically what we're looking at is rehabilitative maintenance. So the most common situation is you have a spouse that's been a stay at home. The other spouse has been working. They make a fair bit of money. Then someone files for divorce. The spouse that doesn't have that experience in the job market, doesn't have those financial resources, is going to need some assistance. And the court is going to step in uh, on, a, on a proper motion, of course, 
and provide that person with either uh, money to pay the rent or the bills or both. You can see this um, either in a combined family support provision or you can see it separate if there is no child support. So it can be combined with child support or it can be standalone. But it's going to be support that's necessary to, to, to maintain that person. And then looking forward in a shorter term marriage, it might be support that's uh, required to get that person trained up in the job market or otherwise some period of time that the court would expect that they would get a job and be able to provide for themselves. There's no magic formula for maintenance. Unlike for child support where we have our, our statutory tables, our child support worksheets, you can put in people's income, you can get out a child support number. Maintenance is not one of those things. Um, you're making an equitable argument. Um, sir. Okay, so the question was about child support and about um, su support that uh, takes up a considerable amount of the obligor, that's the person who pays the child support, their income. Yes. Also a question about whether we're establishing a uniform statutory table of support. Um, yes. Okay. So let me take the second part of that first, which is essentially um, when we, ha we do have model um, guidelines oftentimes uh, for uh, safer for custody, for example. Um, we custodial don't. Parents. I'm sorry? For custodial parents. For custodial parents, right. Uh, we do not have a national standard for child support, and actually it would be kind of hard to adopt that. So there may be model principles being worked on at the, uh, bar, the American Bar Association level. But those are not, the states are not going to be required to adopt anything that comes out. I don't doubt that they're working on some uniformity, but I, Washington State is going to have its own way of monitoring that. It's, it's our state's children, it's our state's standard of income, so th that, 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 that's not going to be required. To have any right. Across all 50 states, so we're not going to see, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying is we're not going to, is to see any requirements that Washington adopt a national model, that, that would not be consistent with the police powers of the state and how we manage our affairs. We may very well see some guidance come out, and I would not be surprised if that's something that you're hearing on NPR. Yes. I'm not aware of it. Um, does that answer that part of the question, sir? Kind of. Which, which gets into the first part of question, the, the question, which is the, the percentage of the income. So. Washington State and all states that I know of have very robust enforcement procedures for child support. So a court order uh, usually has a provision for enforcement of that order. And the state of Washington can and does get at a variety of sources of income to be able to, to pay off that child support. The most common is going to be the, uh, the, the payroll garnishment process, which can also affect active duty service members. Um, that can be then taken directly out of their pay and reflected on their LES statement. But the, uh, they can do a lot more than that. They can, the state of Washington can go after your federal tax return. Uh, they can go after money that's sitting in a bank account with a garnishment order. Um, there are a wide variety of enforcement mechanisms. Now when it comes to payroll, they're, they're limited to, I believe it's 50% is what they're limited to taking Washington out. State Washington's up oh, 55%. Well, I, I stand corrected, but it is around that half mark. Last time I looked, it was 50. I wouldn't be surprised if it's gone up a little bit, but they do have some limits for how much percentage wise um, they can take out. But like I said, that's only one way to get at child support money. Now, I will say that I have had clients uh, who have been very active with the support enforcement officers in terms of being able to work out a payment plan, um, and they're still accumulating arrears unless they modify that child support order. The advantage of them actively working to show that they're making a good faith effort, however, is that the state is less likely to go after their driver's license or other professional licenses if they're in constant communication, if they're making a good faith effort, because people can fall into hard times, right? They can lose a job, they can change jobs, and they might need that um, little bit of extra assistance before the state then steps in and tries to take away uh, a license. So.
I hope that answers that part of the question, but child support is definitely something um, that you should be aware of. Um, but like I said, it can also be lumped into a family support uh, payment. The best interests of the children, that's another kind of big picture thing that we're looking at. That's going to come into play in both a temporary order and a final parenting plan. And what does that mean? Well, uh, there are a variety of statutory factors to consider in crafting a final parenting plan and a temporary parenting plan. What I would say is from, from a practice point or perspective, that usually means which parent is taking a more active role uh, in the child's upbringing and which parent has um, the ability to provide more of a stable household for the child and which parent is more closely bonded with the child. Also, things like uh, mental health pictures can come into play, and this is important uh, for a service member or veteran uh, perspective. If you have a mental health issue, that does not preclude you from being a good parent. However, it is going to be a factor that the court will look at, are you managing it properly? Can you parent this child properly? So. That is something to be aware of as well. If someone is not managing their, their mental health issues and they're not safe for their child, probably they're not going to get very uh, permissive parenting plan until they address those issues. And that's uh, where we can also talk about things like phased in visitation. If somebody is actually dangerous to their child, they're going to be given supervised visitation either at a facility or with a lay person and then once they do the treatment that they need or get the medication that they need, at that point their visitation is going to start opening up. Um, so that's what I've seen consistently at least in Pierce County um, and that's what you want to think of if you're representing a client who's either dealing with those issues or they're very concerned that their spouse is a danger to their children. So the question was, uh, what about parents with PTSD or anger management issues? Yes, sir, that is what I was uh, speaking about uh, in part, um, but there's, there's a broad variety of mental health issues that, that people might have. My concern as an advocate is that there may be a mental health stigma, but when I'm representing someone who has mental health issues, um, I'm very cognizant of bringing it to the court's attention whether or not this actually impacts their parenting ability. Because it's not appropriate to simply label someone as unfit just because they have a mental health issue. Uh, it, it needs to be shown whether or not that has an effect on the parenting ability and whether or not it's managed. The only other big picture item that I'd like to talk about now is the 90 day, what I call the cooling off period. So when I had a client come to me and say, hey, I'm gonna get deployed in a month, uh, I need my quickie divorce now, please. <laughs> I had to say to him, no, I'm sorry. We can get some temporary orders in place. We can do a continuance. We can let the court know. But um, there is this 90-day statutory period here. Now, does that preclude someone from finalizing a divorce when they're deployed? Absolutely not. But they're either going to need to get an agreement or they're going to need to get an attorney. And so that other person can then finish that divorce. Motions practice. This is that um, kind of the along the way practice management aspect of it or case management aspect of it. So a client comes to you and they say, I want to get a divorce. Well, ask them questions. Is the situation stable or is it unstable right now? Are they able to talk with their spouse about who pays the bills? Do they have a special account set up uh, for the mortgage? Are they cooperating? Uh, are they both, have they both set up separate residences or not? Uh, if they're not cooperating, somebody's going to need to go to court to get temporary orders. And what that is, it's, it's on a shortened, sorry, it's on a two week show cause calendar, at least in, in Pierce County and the other counties that I've practiced in. Um, and by the way, there are resources up here that uh, Pierce County distributes to um, self-represented clients. You have to purchase them. I believe they're on the order of $25 or $30. If someone knows the exact number, then shout it out. But it's an affordable packet that you can purchase to have everything you need for uh, filing a motion. 
and they even have sample um, declarations here, notices, return of service. That's all available in the packet. But um, a motion, and these are some key terms to explain to clients, that's you're asking the client for something. Here's what you want them to do. You want them to say who is living in the house in the meantime until the divorce is finished. You want them to say how much the child support payment is going to be, whether or not there's going to be some temporary maintenance. That's what the motion is. A declaration is the testimony, why you want the court to do it. That can be the client's testimony or that can be the testimony of someone who's uh, just a witness to the case. Um, but it needs to be a sworn declaration. We have specific magic language in Washington State and that's uh, part of the sample declaration. I declare under penalty of perjury of the laws of the state of Washington that the foregoing is true and correct. And then they sign and they date and they put where they signed and dated it. That makes it a declaration. The order is what you're getting out of the courts. Um, a minute entry is not an order. Notes that you take are not an order. A comment that the commissioner made or the judge made is not an order. Unless it's actually titled an order, and nobody's <laughs> required to follow it. So I'll hear people say, well, judge said this, the commissioner said that. Well, is it reflected in the order? If not, nobody's legally obligated to follow it. The other thing I have in bold is confirm your hearing. Self-represented clients may not know to do that. They will lose their hearing date. Um, and King County uh, makes it a little bit more difficult, even for attorneys, because I believe you still have to call a phone number. In Pierce County, the advantage of our LINX system, which is the Legal Information Exchange Network, L-I-N-X, is that if you're an attorney who subscribes to this system, or if you're a pro se who has purchased access to that system, you can confirm online, and you can confirm several days in advance, so it's, it's very convenient to do it that way. So I've already spoken about show cause orders. Uh, again, they can protect property, meaning that um, if you have a, a bank account uh, or a 401k, it can prevent someone from liquefying that. Uh, and from, from spending that other than on the necessities of life. Uh, you can establish a temporary parenting plan. Uh, you can, I said allocate property and debts. What I really meant was allocate responsibility for property and debts. Like um, so-and-so feeds the horse. So-and-so pays the credit card bill. And then they can also appoint a parenting investigator. So we spoke about mental health issues a while ago. If you have a client with any kind of mental health issues, uh, a parenting investigator or guardian ad litem um, is probably a good thing uh, to advise them of. I say probably because the report can go against the client. And I've definitely had clients um, that had very high expectations that it was kind of hard to talk them out of. And as an attorney, what I would say sometimes is, well, let's have the parenting investigator talk to everyone. And then ultimately when the report comes out, assuming this person's been fair, at that point I as an advocate have a report to point to that says, well, they looked at all of this. You know, the judge is gonna see this. We have to take this into consideration. So um, the guardian ad litem report can kind of help to point out the weaknesses in your client's case, uh, and it can also help bolster your client's case. There are good guardians ad litem and not so good guardians ad litem. The best ones will uh, try to be neutral, they'll try to talk to everyone, and they're going to write a report that you have at least two months before trial, and possibly even interim reports. Uh, so, um, the other point about motions practice is your local rules. Uh, Pierce County's website uh, is on here, uh, and that will be available electronically. Uh, if you're in Thurston County or Kitsap County or Mason County, King County, any other county, make sure that, that, your, that your client knows that there are local rules and that they need to check them over. Because, if, especially if the other side has an attorney and the person you're advising in the clinic doesn't, they can get hammered, they can get hometown, they can have things uh, stricken, they can have things continued, they can lose um, their motion because they haven't done things properly. And one of the websites I direct them to is courts.wa.gov because that has all of the counties in one spot and that's on the resources tab that we'll look at in a second. Parallel proceedings. I said family law is, is messy and there's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all 
because I can and have had plenty of cases where there's a lot of other things going on. A uh, couple things that I want to talk about um, real quickly. So the first thing up here, DVPO or Domestic Violence Protection Order, and then the Administrative Child Support Hearings. There's something that's called a, I've heard it called like a poor man's divorce or a, a, a cheap way of doing <laughs> divorce. Um, it's not something that I necessarily think is going on all the time, but it's definitely the case for some self-represented clients um, that they can get relief um, on the cheap from using those two processes. I'm not saying people are necessarily abusing it, but if there is domestic violence, um, then you can get what amounts to a parent, as a parenting plan through the domestic violence protection order process to keep the abuser away from the person who's abused, but also to provide that they have a way and a time to see the children, assuming the children weren't the targets of the abuse. And then the administrative child support hearings. Uh, it's fairly easy to request that um, the, the DSHS set a child support hearing and that you get child support set administratively. It's a telephonic hearing. They'll pull up work records. They know your income. Um, and they can set it that way. So it's possible for a client without a lot of resources, especially if they're the victim of domestic violence, to get you know, a status quo going as far as the parenting plan and protecting um, themselves and child support. There are people that believe that process is abused. I would say um, if, it's, if you're the, the attorney for the person or if the person you're consulting with in a clinic setting is being uh, accused of domestic violence, then they definitely want to respond to that. <laughs> and one of the things that they might want to do is file their own motion for a parenting plan and request that the domestic violence court defer to the family law court um, because in that scenario they don't they're, they're much more likely to end up with perhaps a restraining order in a family law case that doesn't have the same stigma attached to it as domestic violence protection order or the same consequences attached to it okay so some other parallel proceedings that might be going on here are a child abuse investigation uh, or a dependency case and so it's my understanding so with regards to CPS, and I understand there's some social worker students here in the, in the audience, and I've had very different experiences with uh, CPS, um, so there, there is no one-size-fits-all for how they'll look at a case. I had a case where they were only too eager uh, with some old child abuse allegations to remove the child from my client's home and to restrict her ability to see them. And then I had another case with some recent uh, admitted physical abuse where they concluded that the family needed counseling and they weren't going to take any drastic actions. So I, I th and it really depends, as I understand it, on what the current political pressures are, what's in the news for, whether they're going to focus more on kind of keeping the family together and counseling or whether they're going to act more immediately to remove the children and set up uh, restraints on the parent who's alleged to have committed abuse. But uh, if there's a dependency case going on at the same time as a family law case, so let's say you have two unmarried parents trying to establish a parenting plan, but one of those parents is also being accused of child abuse or neglect and is in a dependency case, the court can actually combine all of that and make appropriate orders. Okay, one thing that I didn't address yet, sorry, is criminal matters, and remember, if it's in a courtroom, it's public record. So if you've admitted to, or if your client's admitted to an assault in a courtroom and there's an investigation going on, the prosecutor can get those records. That can go very poorly. So you can and do have uh, the right to remain silent. Uh, if there's an active, ongoing criminal issue, you should advise your client to to let their attorney do the talking or in a clinic setting, I guess, to just you know, advise the court that there's a criminal proceeding. And most commissioners and judges that I know, at least in Pierce County, would you know, nod their heads and, OK, I understand that there's some Fifth Amendment issues here. OK. <laughs> so this is a really short clip. I'm just going to play it.
Mr. Harper, you've come here asking for $1,760, which you say is enough money to pay for 16 therapy sessions. My lying and, and stealing and everything that I was doing, it was as a direct result. Now, Mrs. Hicks, you have a lovely voice, but, but I minute, don't want to hear it now. I wouldn't live with her. She wouldn't let me stay here, so I was going to Buffalo. So you're saying you, you have a problem with your anger? Yes, and, and I'm going to anger management class. That's right. That's what the humming is coming from. Oh, that's what yes. the humming is for. It's an exercise so to keep to me calm. calm. You yes, to when keep you me calm. are exci mm -hmm. excited in a state of mm -hmm. agitation. Mm -hmm. woman here but the woman and the ring are here so we're going to bring in the woman and the ring now yes if you hum or whatever you need to do but don't look over there yeah 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 why are you talking while i'm talking oh my lord no, wait, 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 wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute wait hang on The, the reason why I played that, other than the fact that it was fun, um, is to kind of illustrate you know, what can go on in court um, in the sense that people have a lot of emotions going on and things can get kind of crazy. But I think that clip also illustrates another important aspect, which is that if you have a client with a lot of emotions going on, especially if they have any kind of mental health issues, hey, she got that from therapy, right? That was her way to deal with anger. Um, I would recommend a strategy that doesn't actually disrupt courtroom proceedings, but hey, this is TV, so <laughs> I'm sure they told her to go right on ahead. The comment was that, a, that an outburst like that or just singing in the middle of court wouldn't work in the client's favor. That's true. Um, but what's also true is that you should advise clients that have a lot of emotional issues going on. Like let's say they just can't get off the fact that somebody had an affair or they can't get off the fact that you know, they've been in a loveless marriage for 6, 10, 12 years and just been treated like garbage. Well, that person may not be able to focus on writing a declaration or focus on following the local court rules. So they might need that counseling. Again, not recommending singing in court, um, but they may need that counseling. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, discovery for a second. When lawyers are involved, um, they're going to do much more intensive discovery. They're going to do depositions so with a transcriptionist there. Um, they're going to do maybe a CR 35 exam, which is an exam that you would ask if you suspect the, um, the other side of having some mental health issue that makes them not able to parent. You might request that the court order them to do an evaluation uh, under Civil Rule 35. But when lay people are doing this, self-represented people doing this, chances are they'll do little or no discovery. But at the beginning I said there were more sophisticated clients, and that's true. So I have seen um, self-represented people try to um, do their own discovery, and it's possible to do it on the cheap. Uh, the way to do that is by request for admission, uh, which is where you're asking the other party to admit the authenticity of something or the truth of something so that it does not need to be proved at trial. A request for admission can be a very powerful discovery tool because if it's ignored, it's deemed admitted. So that's something to advise your client. That's found under, I believe it's CR 36. Um, most of the discovery rules are found in, under Civil Rule 26, which is all on courts.wa.gov. Um, and the other common thing is the interrogatories or requests, uh, that should be, RFP, not RPF, sorry, request for production, um, which is where you're asking the other side to produce a specific document. So it could be uh, payroll records, it could be, um, could be a police report, it could be a counseling record, and um, those are things that you would request that way. Public records, um, that is particularly helpful if there's been an allegation of domestic violence and there is a police report somewhere out there. Um, that can also be, we heard earlier that there, there was FOIA records within, with respect to the, the VA department. So you might be able to get FOIA records for military, uh, or FOIA requests for military records, but there are 
either FOIA or the Public Records Act, for the state side, there are ways to get at public records to prove up the case. And if the client, especially if the client thinks there's a police report out there that might help their case, um, they should get that document as soon as possible. Okay, so some of the overview terms, again, with property and debts, we're talking about a just and equitable distribution of property and debts. That's the ultimate end goal. So at the end of the day, if it's a short-term marriage, uh, meaning less than 20, 20 at that point we <coughs> consider it a long-term marriage in Washington. So if it's a short-term marriage, the court is looking at putting the parties back to where they started. Uh, if it's a long-term marriage, the focus shifts and the court will start to look at that as, okay, what's the expectation <coughs> for the standard of living that both of these parties uh, would have enjoyed had they stayed married? So in that case, you're more likely to get a larger maintenance award or a longer term maintenance award. Uh, you might also see the court reaching into separate assets to make that spouse that hasn't worked much for the marriage more on an equal playing field to the spouse that say, say they have a successful business and say they have you know, millions of dollars of revenue a year. Well, what standard uh, of living would that other spouse have enjoyed had they stayed married to that person? They're gonna get more property that way. Uh, also, the other thing to look at there is a military pension. If you have a military pension on the table, particularly if it's already vested, this is someone who's already retired who has that money coming in, um, you're going to look at a higher, uh, or if they're right on the cusp and they're about to get their pension, you're going to look at more of a 50-50 distribution of that. If it's a shorter term marriage, uh, one of the myths out there is that the, the spouse might be automatically entitled to have the pension. That's not the case. And one of the other slides that I can uh, bring up in just a second will show that there's a formula that you can use to calculate what a fair distribution of the pension is. And the length of marriage over the overall service term is going to be what the court's going to consider. You multiply that number by whatever percentage you're looking at to distribute it. And it doesn't have to be 50. It can be any percentage that is just and equitable because this is one asset that the court's dividing. There's no special rules with the military pension um, other than one of the main special rules is that DFAS will not distribute the pension unless there's been an overlap of 10 years of service and 10 years of marriage. Now that doesn't prohibit the court from ordering a distribution when those criteria are not met, but it does mean that DFAS itself will not be writing this check. The other aspect is if there are children, the court is going to again look at the final parenting plan that's in the best interest of the children. And a lot of factors can come into play there. Uh, what school system is best? Where the child has family? Who's, but again, the biggest factor is going to be which parent has done more of an active day-to-day -day role in terms of parenting that child. And that could be the dad or the mom. Uh, in Washington State, you know, I've seen, I've seen both. If the, if the mom has not been particularly involved, or if the mom has uh, mental health issues that are not addressed that do make her a danger to her children, she's not likely to get primary custody in that case. So there are two ways to solve a case, uh, or to resolve a case. The first way and the best way that I would recommend, especially if there are children, is through settling. That means work it out. Uh, courts love to see uh, agreed orders. Now you still have to have that 90-day uh, cooling period satisfied, but if you have a settlement, um, chances are it's probably going to be approved. I do have questions from time to time about, will the court really approve this child support amount? Will the court really approve this parenting plan? Well, if it's agreed, then you're much more likely to get it signed. Um, the court is not required and it's not bound by agreements between the parents for a parenting plan if it's completely off the wall, if it's totally unfair, and if it's going to hurt the children, doesn't matter if the parents are agreeing or not, um, chances are that the court's going to make them go back to the table or order something slightly different. I haven't seen that yet, but keep in mind that a court is not bound by agreements of the parents. Uh, with regard to child support, that's another common thing that comes up in a settlement uh, context when parents are presenting child support orders. Is this going to be approved? 
The most common uh, way of sort of deviating from the child support worksheets is to have a, an exact down the middle 50-50 parenting plan. It is possible to have a zero transfer order, but you have to demonstrate to the court why the child will be provided for appropriately in both households and not deprived of resources. And you also have to explain that this is a deviation that's based on this 50-50 shared plan. One thing you cannot do under Washington state law is to say this parent doesn't have to pay child support but nor do they have any access to the children. That kind of agreement would be a violation of our public policy, it would not be approved uh, and if, if it were an attorney they'd be sanctioned. Uh, even, uh, even a pro se. question was um, I think can you have a scenario where a parent would not pay child support and not have access to the child or not have access to the child because they don't pay child support. What I was saying is no, absolutely not. Either scenario is against public policy. So it's possible for a parent to have tens of thousands of dollars in child support arrears but still be seeing their child. Now they're going to have probably their license taken away or their tax returns garnished. They may be even looking at possible uh, jail time as a sanction for that. Um, but assuming they're not actually sitting in jail, uh, the, the parenting plan is going to govern and they're going to have access to that child. Okay, so there was a question about what about a parent who has custody of the child and is still paying child, paying child, child support. The mother right. Or the other spouse. So in that, there, there's only a couple of ways that I can think of that that would happen in Washington State. The first way that that could happen is, let's say there was a parenting plan that was ordered, right, and a child support order that was ordered, and the state is enforcing it. But something then happens to where, in your example, sir, it would be the father, then has to take the, ch the child or the children, um, and is actually raising the child or the children, and maybe the mother's off in rehab, or maybe moved to another state, or something like that, and that parent is still under a child support obligation, the state's still going to enforce that. Um, what that parent should do is go to court and request a modification of both the parenting plan and the child support order in order for the state to stop that. Um, and if they don't change the orders, the state's going to enforce the orders regardless of what the reality is. So it's incumbent upon that parent when there's been a change in circumstances like that to bring that to the court's attention. Uh, it's not just going to automatically stop. So the uh, ways, at least in Pierce County, of getting to a settlement are we're going to have a settlement judge that's going to be uh, listed on, it's really tiny, I'll bring it up in a second, but that's listed on that scheduling order, uh, or in links perhaps, I can't recall if the actual name of the judge is on the order, but it's definitely up on our legal information exchange network. Um, the other way to do it is by contacting the Pro Bono Settlement Mediation Program. There are volunteers, uh, there are oftentimes uh, attorneys who have done family law for a number of years. I don't know exactly what the requirements are, but typically I've seen attorneys of at least 10 years of experience working with family law that can facilitate a settlement of the parties. The advantage of using the judge, um, if, if a judge is available, is they can sign the orders right there. And I will tell you that, um, well, I will tell you one of my favorite judges uh, from a settlement judge perspective has been Judge Nevin. Uh, and if you have military issues uh, in your case and you get him as a settlement judge, thank your lucky stars because he's a retired brigadier general. Uh, he knows what he's talking about as far as military uh, law issues go. And um, he has a good blend of talking to uh, just, just one side or both sides, talking to just the attorneys. He'll do what he needs to do to try to get the parties to settle. That's my favorite um, approach for a settlement judge. I have seen settlement judges that just kind of take a back seat and they don't interject at all. If the clients are polar opposite apart, you're never going to get um, a resolution. What you're going to end up with is, well, we tried, and that satisfied our requirement to try alternative dispute resolution, which is a requirement in Washington State. You have to try some form of alternative dispute resolution to resolve the case. You can't just hold out for trial and not attempt any dispute resolution. So trial. 
that's probably one of the more difficult scenarios to help out your pro se in if you're in a clinic setting. If they're barreling towards trial, if they've already had a failed settlement conference, pretty much uh, make sure that they know to follow the civil schedule. Um, make sure that they understand what's going to be the, their theory of the case. Make sure they get those big picture pieces, best interest of the child, uh, fair and equitable property distribution. Make sure they know where the rules are, and you know, good luck. <laughs> uh, I, 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 yeah, because a judge is going to manage their courtroom, but they're not going to be the attorney for that pro se, and they're going to have a really hard time. The rules of evidence are also going to apply, and so if you have a pro se on one end and a party represented by an attorney on the other end, they're they're seriously outmatched and outgunned. Um, and the judge isn't going to help them more because they're pro se. Right, so that's, that's a good point uh, from Mr. Carl Williams, who is a pro tem judge uh, in Pierce County, um, that the canons of judicial ethics or the code of judicial is ethics, it, yeah, is sir, it, what is code it? Of judicial conduct. Code of judicial conduct um, does allow for, for some assistance to pro se clients. It's my understanding that's more along the lines of, of making sure the proceedings stay on track than, than actually... It's, it's all geared for them to eventually get a fair hearing. Right, the due process is the foremost consideration. And so, so the point uh, for the perspective of advising your pro se client is the judge is not going to be your attorney, but you are entitled to due process. And to the extent that things, uh, that, that you need some direction in order to be able to present your case and have it heard fairly, the judge might step in in a limited capacity. And I would say, yeah, yes, that's, that's true. And I've seen that as, as a new attorney for my first trial. I would say that the judge definitely was aware that I was a newer attorney, my opponent was a newer attorney. And so there was perhaps a little bit more intervention than in more seasoned uh, attorneys would have faced. So I would, I would say, yes, that's a very good point. Thank you. When I was a brand new attorney, um, like I said, I started out with the King County uh, Family Law Pro Bono Program, Pro Bono Mentor Program, and my go-to resources were here. <laughs> uh, let's start with um, the forms, first of all, courts.wad.gov forms. You can pull that up. In the version that you get electronically, those will be hyperlinked. You can pull up all of the forms that you need. Um, again. I would go and pick up one of these checklists because the library has done a very good job of putting together a packet with all of the forms you need to finish your case, start to finish. Um, so that's one resource to direct clients to, especially in Pierce County. Uh, Ledge.wad.gov is where you're going to find both the RCWs, the Revised Code of Washington, and the WACs, the Washington Administrative Code. Washington Law Help is an amazing resource both for a pro se client and for a new attorney or an attorney who maybe doesn't do family law um, all that often because they have a number of publications designed to help clients figure out a particular problem. And I believe the Northwest Justice Project puts that together. Is that correct, Sarah? Yes. Uh, so they're a very good resource. Uh, then also the courts.wa.gov has a court rules tab, which can get you county specific if you're clicking on Superior Court and it'll show you a list of all of the counties. It'll take you to the online courts resource so that your clients can actually see what they're dealing with as far as when, how far in advance to file a motion, um, how to confirm a motion, um, how, when to respond and what are the page limits for a response. Again, they have to follow all those rules, even if they're pro se. I have seen some leniency and some latitude, but I've also seen commissioners and judges really crack down on that. Um, and they're required, or they're entitled to hold the pro se clients to the same standard as attorneys. They often do. Thank you very much.